herzlich willkommen zu unserer heutigen Veranstaltung von WIFT Germany, WIFT Hamburg, im Rahmen des Filmfestes Hamburg. Ich, mein Name ist Gudrun Lehmann. Ich möchte ganz kurz was zu WIFT sagen. Ich bin eine der Repräsentantinnen. Hier ist Sandra Quadflieg, Kim Seidler und Verena Gräfe-Höft, meine Mitstreiterinnen. Wir engagieren uns hier für WIFT Hamburg. Worum geht es bei WIFT? Das ist ein internationales weibliches Branchennetzwerk für Film, Fernsehen und digitale Medien. Uns geht es darum, mehr Frauen vor und hinter der Kamera zu haben äh, und natürlich mit allen Merkmalen der Gleichstellung. Unser heutiges Thema ist die Kernfrage. Das Schöne an WIFT auch ist, wir sind ein internationales Netzwerk. Es gibt also auf der ganzen Welt Vernetzungsmöglichkeiten, die man auch schon heute nutzen kann. Sie können gerne Mitglied werden, um uns zu unterstützen. Wir haben schon sehr viele Mitglieder in Hamburg. Sie können unseren Newsletter abonnieren, um äh, informiert zu sein, welche Veranstaltungen wir machen. Hier hinten liegen Flyer an diesem kleinen Tisch, wo man Näheres erfahren kann. Und natürlich können Sie uns einfach so unterstützen. Vorbildlich hat das heute die kanadische Botschaft gemacht und äh, die Anwaltskanzlei Gref und das Filmfest Hamburg natürlich. Ganz herzlichen Dank. Yes, a warm welcome also to our international guest, uh, Wift Nordic is here. Welcome to Hamburg. <laughs> so this panel is going to be in English and we are very proud that we could uh, win over uh, Katja Eichinger, who's going to be the presenter and who's going to be uh, digging in into the question of diversity. And so um, just have fun. We're going to open up for questions later on. But now we would love you to listen to our great guests. Welcome. Well, hello. Um, thank you all for coming. It's very, um, I'm very excited um, because I think um, women in film, we spend a lot of time complaining about guys and the inequality of it all and what's wrong going wrong and the boys club and all this. And what we have here today is a panel of women who can change that and have been changing that, the policymakers, people who have um, access and spend public funds and make the policies that will and can create gender equality in film and television. Um, and we have here to my very right, it's uh, Maria Köpf. She's the head of the Hamburg Film Fund. Um, make having a <laughs> great <laughs> yeah, <laughs> applause. <laughs> um, her background is actually um, in production. That's how we met a long time ago. Um, she used to be head of X, X Filme in Berlin and then ran um, the Berlin office of Zentropa, the Danish company. <coughs> um, so she has been on both sides, the production side and the um, um, distributing side, distributing, making the choices to give away public money. Then we have here, very proud to present, um, Jana Schiedek who is now the councillor for, uh, for cultural affairs of the Senate of Hamburg. So you're in charge. <laughs> and what I find really fascinating is uh, you're actually a lawyer and your background was working in the harbour, a very male-dominated um, uh, domain. And, um, and also uh, you used to be the uh, senator for justice and equality here in Hamburg. And you, well, let's go into that <laughs> later. Um, and then we have Anna Serner, the head of the Swedish Film Institute, who um, is really one of the, on the forefront of gender equality in film. Uh, there's so much to say and so much to talk about what you've achieved, um, something that we can really look up to. And then from uh, Canada, French-speaking Canada, Quebec, um, Monique Simard, the head of um, Zork, and you're really in, in charge of also um, not just film, but all kinds of cultural enterprises and how to develop them. And um, I really want to know later on, because you're dealing a lot with co-productions and international productions and how you can um, 
use that public money to generate gender equality. Film, television, music, book publishing, everything. Everything. Name it, we have it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so d today we we really want to find. Uh, I want to hopefully we'll find out more of what these women are doing, uh, the problems they encounter, and what's in store for the future. But um, before we go into that, um, I really want to address, it's even more, it's not even an elephant in the room, it's the one thing that everybody's talking about um, that's, uh, that's really to do with gender equality and the abuse of power, which is Harvey Weinstein. Um, and um, most of us know him or have encountered him. Um, and also, most of us have heard the rumors. I don't know. I mean, um, to me, none of this was a surprise. Um, you've always heard the rumors. And um, uh, it feels like a, a family secret that everybody knew about has suddenly been lifted and everybody's up in arms. And um, uh, it also feels like it, we have to realize that we've been part of a culture, part of an industry that enabled a guy like that. Um, that enabled that kind of addictive behavior, sex addiction, if you want to call it that. But um, I want to, that's my opinion. Um, I would love to talk to Maria about this because you've actually worked with him. Yeah, we co produced a film called Heaven, directed by Tom Tikva, um, with um, Miramax as co producer at the time, and I had a couple of encounters with Harvey Weinstein. And I must say, not that anybody knew in deeps and depths what's really going on, but there it, it was just an aura around this guy where I could tell, like, he's behaving like a pig, you know, and nobody says anything because he's rich and powerful. And to me, it's quite amazing that this could be kept a, an open secret for such a long time. And it's uh, extremely daring of these young actresses to speak up now and to make it reveal it all over, you know, to the public. And now so many people are following and... Um, confirming actually what had happened. I mean, it's that to live in, a, in an industry, but it's not only the industry, I would say it's the society in general that enables rich and powerful men to behave like pigs. Come on. Mm. I just I have to tell a short story because I was just driving here from the Cinemax and I, and I in my little, little car and I took a wrong turn and I ended up on Neuer Wall, which is a really sh rich shopping mall here. And there's this Rolls Royce in front of me. And I was like, come on, <laughs> it takes forever. <laughs> The door opens and there ex there's a woman getting out and literally, I'm not lying to you, she wore a little mink cape and to me it looked like it was either naked or it was just um, like a full body pantyhose, something like this, entering a rich a store and it was just like, what kind of power does it give to men to expose their women like this to the public? I'm just feeling uh, gross, this is just gross and, and watching like this, it's, it makes me speechless, you know. Mm. This is just the level of misogyny we're surrounded with. And, and I mean, in the relationship to power, I mean, I, I think what's shocking, uh, like dealing with him on a business level was pretty, I mean, he was a bully and uh, f famous for sort of make pressurizing and using his power to renegotiate contracts and the very few people uh, in the industry um, who would stand up against him. Yeah, he was also famous directors, like I spoke to Anthony Minghella, because he was also co-producer at the pro at, at, uh, at the pro on the project, <coughs> saying he never saw any money from the English patient, which, as you probably all remember, a really, really successful art house film at the time, the type of films we don't really have these days anymore, because crossover art house is not that um, successful anymore. The film grossed millions and millions worldwide, and the producers never saw a penny, you know, but you just wouldn't sue Harvey Weinstein, because he was too powerful. Mm. Nobody dared to. It's it's incredible how a system like this could sustain itself for such a long time. Mm. I mean, also the I w I would think that if he had had um, an addiction like let's say um, drug addiction um, or gambling, even even shopping, I think somebody would have intervened. <laughs> somebody would have stepped up and done some kind of intervention. But because it was to do with sex and power, nobody did somehow which I thought is, is kind of outrageous. And yes, but so many people were profiting from the system, as a matter of fact, because he enabled and he started so many careers. And this is especially during the golden era of the 90s, where Art House was really big, not only in the US, but worldwide. He opened doors for so many people, and he was really powerful. Also, his way at looking at films and giving comments, you know, and giving films a shape, which he quite often did, you know, intervening in the editing room. And he made careers to so many people, so that nobody really dared to speak up and to say anything against it. It's 
a quite fragile, a quite difficult and interesting mix of power, money, and you know, giving people opportunities. Mm. Mm. And yeah, so how, is there anybody? I mean, I, we did this somewhere before. I, I um, do you have any? I'm sure you've encountered um, people like that in your career. Um, do you have any? T I mean, also you you working in the harbor that <laughs> must must not have been can't have been easy. Uh, do you have any tips on how to react when something completely when you're confronted with something completely outrageous? Well, it's it's always depending on the situation. Uh, in the harbor, in politics, you, everywhere. Actually, it's not only a problem of uh, film business. I, I would say it's as you said. A problem of society, and always you have um, powerful men using dependent uh, people, especially young women. Mm. Um, well, the first thing I always tried in the beginning was to take it with humor, but um, well, that was a different situation. Mm. Actually, I can say now it's easier for me being in a powerful position. People don't dare that as much as they did before. Um, because you, you learn to speak out and you, you learn to react. If somebody calls you honey, you call him honey back. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, you have to confront the people what they are doing, um, even if it's just a joke. Um, or, uh, I mean, it's always this mixture between I'm kind of your father and, and also this male, female behavior. So uh -huh. um, you always have to find the right um, way either to take it with humor or to really react to it. Mm -hmm. um, but I think in the show business, it's, it's everywhere, but in show business even more, because there's a lot of young people, young women, good-looking young women, and there's so many candidates for a few jobs. So they're totally vulnerable. Mm -hmm. But then again, look at Dominique Strauss-Kahn, mm -hmm. almost became president of France, if it was not for a chamberman, an African-born, uh, African chamberman in New York that said, he raped me. Mm -hmm. But everybody knew. Like when it came out, everybody knew in France that he was a sexual predator. And let's talk about the locker room talks of President, President Trump. So it is permitted in society. And the men that have the most powerful jobs still get away with it. So. How can you say, I've been, I'm old, and when the, more, the older you get, the less you have. So <laughs> that's what the good thing about getting old, you know? <laughs> uh, but still, it, it takes a lot of courage to say no. Me, it's once, I started with university professor. Mm -hmm. And the, it starts there. And, and sometimes even earlier than that. But I think now as well, like this came up and everyone is really, really reacting. And I think that right now there is a movement where almost everyone realizes that this is not okay. So uh, I think that we should take the, the movement uh, and continue it. But it sounds really easy to say that you should always say something, but we all know that if everyone else is silent, it's really, really hard to speak up. And you have to choose your moments. You have to pick your fights. But I think that if we find people doing it, we should always think of supporting. And I think as well, these like neglecting uh, comments like honey, or you, know, you get to hear very stupid remarks. What uh, I have done, and I can really recommend it, it's a very good fun as well, is to make a short list of uh, uh, telling people off in one sentence, uh, which is, uh, you know, you can really use it very well, and it, but you need to find them because they're not that easy, so they slip out of your mouth very fast. It's like when people ask you for, well, do you have any female directors? It's hard to remember them because they don't get as much limelight. So you make lists of names and you should make lists of one-liners. And I've done that and that is very helpful. And after a short while, people actually uh, understand that, oh, she's that kind of boring person. So they, uh, they, they say it and then they say, hey, you know, I'm so sorry, Anna, but you know, 
and then you can start talking about it. But I think it's, uh, it's time to take the momentum mm -hmm. now because uh, it will go back again. So now this could be a, a shift, like a, a true shift could happen. So we when use but yeah. it's interesting in the ones that did target Harvey Weinstein were not the stars. Mm -hmm. They were yeah. not really well-known actresses or whatever. And then the big stars came after, mm -hmm. which is really interesting to see is that, okay, Emma Thompson and Ellen Mirren and what, 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 I don't remember all the names, Angela Jolie, or, but how come the powerful ones Never. did not no, denounce it before the other one? That's a something to question. Yeah, it's very true, yeah. Great, so um, Anna, mm -hmm. I would love to start off with you. Um, Sweden is often mentioned as the role model in terms of um, when it comes to gender equality, um, you have in t t 2013 a law was introduced, or since that you um, that there has an e there has the money has to be equally distributed for um, uh, people both in sexes. both yeah. sexes, mm -hmm. you know, in in key positions with within a movie either. And since then, you've really seen um, uh, numbers of female directors soaring, as far as I understand. And well. Uh, what really happened was that we don't have a law like that, mm. but we got the assignment like politicians gives out to the society. So we got the assignment, you get the public funding. The Swedish Film Institute is like the FFA in Berlin. So it's, uh, we are the most important funder for all films to be made. And it's a small country. So it, I mean, I realized that our money is good tools because they will, lead the way. Mm. So we got the assignment of, we had before, to aim for 4060. And I was appointed in 2011. And uh, I've been an outspoken leader and being a woman, mm. which is very rare. So I, I had the media's attention already. So what I did immediately, I, I knew I was going to get the question from the reporter. So the first thing they said, so what do you say, Anna? You only fund 26% female directors in long feature. And uh, knowing how headlines works, uh, I wanted the attention. So I said, yeah, that is a catastrophe. And I got the headline. It's a catastrophe, says Anna Cerner. And then I said, I think 40, 60 is rubbish. I think we should all aim for 50-50 over time. Not every year, but over time, we should be giving as much money to women as men, as long as we believe that women are capable of telling stories that others are interested in, which I do believe. Uh, and actually not all do believe that. So that you have to sort of start off with that. Uh, and saying 40, 60 is rubbish was a bit scary. And uh, then I said that I will aim for 50, 50. And to reach that, I will uh, make an action plan. Stop, talk, start to act. Uh, and give it a budget. And in the end of 2015, this was in 2012, if we haven't uh, achieved 50-50, I'm not afraid of quota. Mm -hmm. That was a very clear message. I love threats. Uh, <laughs> the carrot uh, wasn't existing by that time because I, of course, didn't know how this would end. So uh, what I did was that I made five clear, I made an action plan that I could send out. I launched it very openly, so it got a lot of media attention. And the actions are really very simple. Uh, we met every argument of why it isn't equal. And there are, very, um, there are a lot of women here, so you will probably uh, remember uh, hearing, but she's not good enough. We can't find any good enough women. So we decided to prove them wrong, so we started a, a database of uh, all women in Swedish film history in key positions of directing, producing, script writing, 
editing and cinematographers, and we are adding it on now. So this is an open source uh, database, which means that we can always, if anyone says, but there aren't any women, we can just push a button, and yes, there are. And then we had uh, the next uh, argument you usually hear is that she's not experienced enough. She has only made one long feature, so she can't have the big budget, or it's always that she is less experienced. And research shows that men are picked on potential while women are picked on experience. And as we never seem to have the potential, we never get the experience. So we made a mentorship course, uh, and that was actually a feministic course, to get the women to understand how they strategically had to move around the gatekeepers, like the distributors, the producers, our film commissioners. And there are a lot of gatekeepers saying no. Mm. And then we started a research two different research, one in preschool or pre-film school, what happens with women when they say they want to become film directors, how come it actually is that some women say no and you don't understand why, until you realize that the young women, uh, when they say they want to become film directors, they get to hear, are you crazy? Do you realize what kind of a you know competition and you will be traveling and you will be away weekends and how will you take care of your children and family are you sure you have enough to be able to do that are you sure you want to pick that path to become a bad mother it's the underlying sense that no one says but that is what we <laughs> get to know and when young men says the same thing i want to become a film director Research shows that what they get to hear is, are you crazy? It's such a hard competition, but what the hell you go? What do you have to lose? Just go for it. You get everything. So they build self-confidence while we push down young women. Mm -hmm. And there is this term of double punishment. You are a bad mother that want a career, and in your career, you're not good enough because how will you take care of your children? So we, we always have to face that. And we made a research within the industry. Is there differences between film industry and other industries? And that was actually uh, just mm -hmm. a pretend uh, act because I wanted the film industry to interact. And uh, this was the way to get them to interact. And they did the men as well, which is very good. But the, f the very most important thing we did was we started to count every decision. Mm -hmm. So we take funding decisions 10 times a year, and we fund short documentaries and long features, uh, about 100 films a year. So it's like 10 films every month. And if you only count once a year, and a lot of countries don't count at all, and some parts of Germany doesn't. Uh, that means that you make the counting in the end of a year, and then you, you're ready, and you publish it, and it becomes March or April, and it's like, oh shit, it didn't happen last year either. And then you're already halfway into the next year, so it just keeps on. So what we are doing is counting once a month and adding on the numbers. So we can see that, huh, how come only 20% female directors? You go out search. You haven't looked good enough. So that means that uh, both our money is talking very loudly. We look for women. Then the production companies who want the money, they understand. You, do you actually have a quota? Mm -hmm. No. So this is really just what you want to do, it's and that's uh, okay. Which means that uh, we are still, we are definitely not gender equal, uh, like any other country. Last year in Cannes, we had our biggest production company. The CEO was caught by police being so wasted. He hit down one of his producers, and uh, they had a boat called Naughty by Nature, and. <laughs> He actually hit the guy down in a strip club. 
No yeah. one dared to say anything because they're the most important production company. Finally, some reporter got someone to speak out. And that, I mean, it's exactly the same thing. But uh, we, I mean, we are not gender equal and that means that we can see in the bigger budgets, women uh, don't get them still. So now I said in Toronto, I say, if we don't see that the women get bigger budgets, I'm not afraid of quotas. Mm -hmm. So watch out 2019, I do the quotas because it showed now when we see the effects of five years of constantly having female directors that Swedish film has never been so strong. It's a matter of quality on all levels because when the women start being counted as possible, the men realizes, shit, I have to shape up. I really need to be ambitious because I need that money. So they shape up. Mm -hmm. And so now when we're counting this year, we have a Swedish film has won in Sundance. We won the Golden Palm in Cannes. We opened the Toronto Film Festival. We have never, during the past five years, had so many films in the international top festivals, the A-listed festivals, ever. And more than 50% were made by female directors. Yeah. So that really proves to me, you don't have to be afraid of quotas, though I don't want to do it because then you only talk about the quotas. But uh, my threat is for real. And I think everyone realizes that. So I'm just waiting for threat. the uh, yeah. bigger budgets yeah. for women now. <laughs> <laughs> But it also seems like the battle of the sexes is very good for cinema. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so do you, ha do you have quotas in Canada? No, I use Anna's threat, the threat of the threat of quotas, <laughs> which really works well. <coughs> and I think this is a really interesting seeing all these so many people because we must inspire each other from one country to another uh, and say, oh, they're doing that there. Why couldn't we not do it here? Because Everywhere we will get the same opposition, which is, first of all, quality. We choose the best. <laughs> Say, ah, oh, you choose the best. How come there's no women in the best or so, le so you know, few women? So we will face everywhere the same prejudice. And we all know that the obstacles are systemic. So we are powerful women. Well, yeah, a bit, yeah. We have the bank. <laughs> We fund the films. So we have to use that power to attack the system. How do we attack it? So uh, in Canada, in Quebec, uh, we have a double system like in Germany, you know, federal and the provinces here, it's Landers, where we have, it's different, but we still can act very much because it's public, public money mostly that does fund films. So we can, in our systems, how we, analyze them, change them. So we have a plan of action also, and we've used the Swedish example. Anna came and did conferences, and we, are all, we had implemented measures, but at one point, they're too soft. You say, you, so you have to be harder. So our system was the following. We said, okay, 50-50 in 2020, so in three years now, so we changed that two years ago. And we said, okay, in our programs. In our program, we have for fiction films, which uh, we produce, we, so, you know, we fund documentaries, or other short films, et cetera, but fiction films, we said, there's only two times in a year where producers can come up with a proposal. And the problem was, is that we didn't get that so many proposal from women directors or women script writers, because the filters were producers, distributors, and they would not come up. And they could have only two projects per, for example, there's August and January, two projects per date. We said, finish now. It's one project. Two, if there's a woman, a filmmaker or scriptwriter. And we did mathematical hypothesis, you know, curves. Oh, wow. And we, we said, this is going to change. It did change. Because the producers, could not take the chance of having just one project. They had to have a second one if they want to survive as producers. 
So it changed completely. And whoop, of course, there was opposition saying, you can't do this to us. You know, my company is going to go bankrupt. I don't have any. Go and look and find the women. They're there. How, how does it work when you know, a lot of American companies come to Canada? No, no, they don't come. Ah. They don't come. <laughs> <laughs> you want to talk about Netflix? No, later. Uh, it, no, we only fund Canadian companies. Okay. okay. So the second thing that we, we said in our plan of action, this is the first thing. It's very concrete, very direct. Back, it's there. And it always has get, given results because we've raised... 10% the proposals coming from women. Second, we said, and Anna touched on this, how come in film school there's just as many young women and young men that are selected? And it's very selective. Film schools are, at least in Canada, it's very, very selective. How come there's just as many that are selected? But when they come out three or four years after, the Men go to directing and the women go to production and assistant production. Something happens during those years. So our hypothesis is that there is a changing of role in the tr formative university film school years. So we made an agreement with a very good film school, which is Concordia University, one of the best in North America. This follow for th four years a group what, what, are, what is the role playing during those years that makes it that in the end, one, they go more into production and the other one into filmmaking. And the third thing we have been working on for now um, uh, more than a year and a half is unconscious bias. So unconscious bias, you go to producers, is unconscious bias, what's that? They don't even know the concept of unconscious bias. <laughs> Nobody is biased. Of course I'm for equality. You know, and you go to the people in the business, of course I'm for equality. But the, the concept of unconscious bias, it's everywhere. So we've developed um, workshops on that, offering them to everybody in the industry. So they, they integrate that, yes, in their everyday, the way they do business, there is a part of systemic discrimination. We hope that in 2020 we will get the um, uh, you know equality. It's not for sure, maybe, but certainly it will be better than it was before. Now, there's one thing that is different. There's Telefilm Canada, SEDEC, but there's one thing that we make very differently is that Telefilm has a program which is okay with the same objective, but they put women, uh, ethnic minorities, uh, native people all in the same pot. And that I disagreed completely. I said women are not a minority. And you don't put them in the same pot as minorities. You have to take care of minorities, that's for sure. Not in the same programs. You have to, it, it's different. So um, it's, it's, you really have to, because we do control the systems. We're the ones, you know, there's a lot of gatekeepers, but you can change the rules for the gatekeepers. Mm -hmm. And that's the power we have. And we have to use that power. And it's not easy. It's not easy. You know, the minister will say, are you sure you want to do this? Uh -huh. And another one. And, it's, and, and, you know, you have to go around them. What, but what are the main obstacles you face? The main obstacles are, well, um, it's the quality argument. Uh -huh that we have, you know, juries and we have commissions and we have this and they're unbiased. No, that's not true. There are bias. So you have to make it sure that the system will make it that you get as much more proposals as, as you are. And hopefully it, it, I think it's, it's going, it's, I think it's going to work. It's I think that the main yeah. obstacle, I mean, that is for sure. Yeah. The sort of uh, what everyone agrees on, the quality which is, what is quality? Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm, I'm a lawyer in my background. I was in film school. I realized I will never be able to do film, so I will line up making coffee. So I decided to skip it 25 mm -hmm. years ago, uh, whatever it was, 30 now. And uh, so I've tra I'm a trained lawyer now. And uh, you know I come back and I get these uh, people 
claiming that this is quality. And I was like, as a lawyer, you want argument. You're a lawyer as well. Yeah, we want argument. And I was like, you have to explain what is quality. So we decided on three words, which is relevance, originality, and craft. So every time we make a decision, the one that wants to propose the film has to make clear in what way this film is relevant or urgent. And that could be for a comedy, if it's not, you know, touching today's society and touching the, the, the urgent things in society, no one will find it funny. And if it's an art house and you're into a political film and doing <coughs> things that is not urgent right mm. now, like House of Cards missed out in the last season because society Reality went... Took over, yeah. Yeah, but then to... To argue of these three words makes people actually talk about the film project and not the gender. And that is very, very, very helpful. I mean, I'm thinking unconscious bias would be an interesting um, uh, workshop to run in, in German film and television. I, I was just, I mean, I was just at the, uh, talking about Germany now, uh, I was at the premiere of Babylon Berlin the new series that you now see advertised everywhere. The really like a landmark event because it's never been of such a scale. Um, has there been such a series? And the people involved, I mean, we all love Tom Tickwell, I do. And all these people, but what really shocked me was like I was sitting there and it was obviously a state event with the Secretary of Interior and the Berlin mayor present and all the people on stage until the actors arrived were men. It was just a massive boys club. And I'm like, okay, this is how Germany and the new generation of German film and television making is going out in the world. And obviously there was a big screening in LA. Um, this is how, this is, this is okay. Yeah, German television, um, mm -hmm. boys with toys. I mean, uh, <laughs> well, how, um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Um, uh, how how do you how talking about unconscious bias? <laughs> how are we gonna? How do we deal with that? I think you just wanted to make a comment. Yeah, yeah actually, I, I I know all these stories so good. Not from film. It's not, I'm quite new in my job. I just started in February, mm. but um, I have such a deja vu on <laughs> <laughs> uh, because I had all these discussions and former um, discussions about uh, quota for for advisory boards. Oh, in Hamburg, what I did as a senator for justice and well, gender equality was a board law um, for all boards here in Hamburg, starting with the Art Commission up to all the boards of uh, public um, um, and companies. You, and you suggested um, that mm. all German, like all the boards oh, Hamburg, of Hamburg, I can just move. Oh, well, <laughs> so, well, just um, that all the boards of. Uh, list, uh, publicly listed ge companies at the German Stock Exchange should oh, be 50-50. Yeah. Uh, that create quite created quite a wave, no? 40-60. Uh, oh, <laughs> yeah. we, we started low, but um, yeah, it did. But actually what I said at the same time was um, we can't ask uh, the private industry something we don't do for ourselves. So uh, what I did at the same time was a law for Hamburg um, for all the boards here, all different boards, and um, same discussion about quality and actually um, also in politics the discussion came like okay if we do a quota for all the boards uh, we should also install some uh, regulations for quality yeah. and I said like that's a very good idea to finally bring quality to the boards, yeah. but <laughs> never in the same discussion with a quota <laughs> for gender equality. Are you, are you sick? I mean, mm -hmm. but that's always the quality discussion and they really wanted to take it at yeah. the same time. And I was like, well, in two years we do that because, um, well, in two years we don't need it anymore because then <laughs> women are on the boards and then the quality discussion is over. But it's always always the same time that the quality discussion yeah. comes. So, and it's always looking at Scandinavia where we learn from. I always talk to Norway or Sweden. Um, so uh, actually I'm listening a lot to you because um, there's so much to learn because from you. And I started my speech in the Bundesrat also naming all the countries who have quota already. You know, one of the most vicious things is that women integrated also. 
Okay. Internal I don't want to yeah. be. I don't want to be chosen because I'm a oh, woman. Oh, yeah. I want to be chosen because of my competence. But it, 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 there's a contradiction there between competence and women. That it's a message that women have integrated themselves, which we have to break. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so the discussion. Do you really want to be a quota woman? Yeah. <laughs> Yes, if I get the job, sure. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. If I at or least have a chance to get the job, yeah. I don't care. Have you ever asked that to a man? If you, because Olaf Scholz, the mayor of Hamburg, said at that time when I got a senator, I want a 50-50 Senate. And uh, newspapers really asked me, so how does it feel to be a quota woman? And I said, like, have you ever asked that one of the 50% quota of men? I mean, it's How does it get, feel to get the job because you're a man and you've been privileged? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But I actually, because if some man comes to me, male producer, and I, yeah, but Anna, you do quotas. Now. No, we don't do quotas. Look at the, our national award, which women wins more than the men. Yeah, but that's your award. So you're, you're doing the quota. We have juries, so it's like, yeah. And then I said, so are you stupid? You know the way to get an award and you don't pick a woman, so you get the award? Then you're not a businessman. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you're actually right in that. I will do that the next time. <laughs> but it's really, it's, uh, they actually believe it. Uh, even women, though. But I, I, wanted, I want to ask Maria, how do you, you know, you've been working in the German film industry for a while and now you're in, in charge of the public funding, how, what's your sense of the equality situation? Actually, I think things are not going so bad at all. I mean, we've had uh, quite uh, artistically spoken some outstanding films made by women. I mean, two of them won a German film award, Anne Zora Berache. There is uh, Maria Schrader with her film. There is The Wild by Nicolette Krebitz. There is uh, Charlotte uh, Hegemann with her Axolotl Overkill, which I particularly like mm -hmm. because it's so weird and outstanding and artistic. I love that one. Yeah. I think mm -hmm. in just in, in terms of artistic films being made by women, we're doing really, really well these days. And also three out of the films last year, which were among the top ten, were directed by women, for instance, uh, Ich bin einmal weg by Julia von Heinz. I think there's a lot of things happening already. And uh, of course, I had a look at our figures in our fund and what it looks like and what it used to look like and until the year 2012. We had an application rate. We have to, I, mean, I think we have to differentiate be between how many people are applying to get funding and, and, and how many are awarded. Until 2012, we had like a, sh a share of 25% 25 per 25 of women applying for the fund, and now it's gone up to 35%. So it's out of the applications we're receiving, 35% are already handed in by women these days, which is an enormous increase only in like and a couple of years. And how many get the money? Uh, the money is uh, in our, statistically, we've given to 49% of the female projects and to 46% of the male projects. But what so does it mean in total? How much of the total money goes to women? Well... If you say it's more than a third of the women applying and we're giving out more than half of them. So like 30, 35 percent. Yes, mm. I would say it's 40 because it's 35 percent applications and we're awarding more women, rewarding more women than men. So it's around 40 percent. That's not actually I'm qu not such a bad figure at all. And within the fund, we, we like to work with, of course, with encouragement and we I love to receive projects, to, to, to receive projects by female directors. and. We have some great female directors here in Hamburg, and um, I think it's looking at. <laughs> but you don't. <laughs> at you, you, don't you, <laughs> you haven't had the. F mm. if you haven't felt like you needed to threaten with a quota or go into the quota battle. I'm actually a little pr procrastinating on the quota battle because I strongly believe we're still talking about art, mm. and I would like to encourage women on the artistic side and say, c "Come on, let's make some great films. Let's make films that challenge ourselves. That we would like to see films that are good, fee pe films that make people go to the movie theaters, which is overall also an important question that we need to address because with the European film, we our market share is not exactly going up." but it's relatively, it's, it's going down rather in the last couple of years. So we really need to think about our audiences out there and what they want to see. So of course, it's also a question of what do these women out there want to see? And I think we need to spend a lot more time thinking about that and addressing that and listening to audiences and think about what can we, what kind of films can we make, especially for women, also in terms of empowerment, you know? I mean, um, and sort of what I was experiencing, the was that you think that was a one-off, the boys club on, on stage at the premiere, 
Was that just an unfortunate, yeah. um, was that just my perception? No, it's always <laughs> I've been like that quite a lot. And I, <laughs> <laughs> I was part of many companies and, you know, XM is for, for you were, men you were the, and I was the, the girl, exactly. You were the girl, the yeah, boy yeah, girl. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, she used to be head of production <laughs> at XM, yeah. And that's just how it is, you know. It's mm. And there's an, uh, not li need, it still needs to be changed. But I, I as, as long as I can, uh, and I'm, it's been like 20 years now, more than 20 years that I'm in the business, I have a sense it's changing. You know, we just have to give each other a strong of encouragement, a sense of encouragement, and encourage young people and uh, young women, and tell them there is a career for you out there. Uh, but we also have to. We're talking only about the film business. I think it's not only a matter of. Um, we talked about it last night. It's not only in terms of. Um, how do you change the structures within the film industries? I mean, everybody knows and has to know this is a hard job. Both producing and directing is really hard jobs. And what happens with these young women when they come out of film schools, a lot of them want to start a family. Of course, it's the age. That's, I guess, what happens to many young women. And it's still considering the possibilities we have for day child care and uh, lacking opportunities for women on that field. And in, I think that's an overall political issue we have to address, because if there were more, more possibilities for women to know, you know well, what can they do with their young children while they are directing a film, I'm sure that would bring up the quota tremendously, because that's the main problem we face, let's be honest. But men do get children too. <laughs> they take yeah. food to tango. So I mean, it's really, I don't know how many women you have going into film school, but in my experience, there is the uh, uh, perception that women don't want to make films to be seen w in big audiences. And if you go out, I would say it's probably true that in the percentage, there are more women that are into art house because we are, as well need to understand that women get so heavily criticized all the time. So we really, really want to do things we can stand for and if you have your own story you can really stand for that but i am so sure that there are women out there wanting to do those films so i think that the i didn't say anything different <laughs> no, no, no 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 but i'm just uh, uh, the perception of what we challenge within like the production industry is that we need to go to do that and then women suddenly is a problem i think we need to get the production companies to understand that there are plenty of good female directors that wants to do those kinds of films um Relating to the issue of how you conciliate work and family, it's true. It's because you get out of university about the same age, in the late 20s, and mm -hmm. that's childbearing age. Is, well, it's, it's getting a bit further now. But it's true for all professions. So I think there is a, a, a more systemic barriers in the artistic world mm -hmm. than in other sectors. Uh, like women doctors, engineers, or accountants, or lawyers, etc. We still have, you know, pressure, etc. But in the artistic world, where you're freelance, you don't have a steady job most of the time. That is a real issue. Mm. Uh, where the money is not as good as in other sectors of society. So it's true that it's it's a real argument. But that is to us as a society to work around these things and offer daycare to everybody, offer good maternity leaves. Well, in Canada, we're one of the best systems in the world. You know, it's a year full pay for everybody, whatever the job is. So that is making that, working on these issues and gaining these social uh, uh, measures helps everybody, but will help in the end even more women in culture and in filmmaking. And that's, I, so I agree with you in, in a way that, that, that we cannot ignore that no, uh, and also problem. Would, yeah, that would be, to ignore it would to, to um, yeah, because it's true. Would change it. It's yeah. true. But if it, you have a baby mm -hmm. and it takes two years to make a film and you have no money. I mean, what, it, what, is, uh, what I found interesting talking to you was uh, that you had, you used to be a senator and then um, you had a, a child, and you chose to uh, step back, take a step back, and After look at... After working a year. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> with well, a baby. Yeah, with a baby, realizing that maybe, you know, you're missing out. And um, mm -hmm. it took t some time back, but you did come back into politics, and that was really the help of the, uh, the mayor who supported you, you know, or somebody... Um, so bosses need to be 
supportive of and and don't need to as soon as you have a kid just write you off and you don't no longer exist or of course he never wrote me off mm. i mean he he was um not amused when i said well after i got my baby during the time as a senator and then worked after eight weeks again for a year um i don't remember first half year <laughs> actually but um Apart from that, no, after one year, the uh, legislation ended and I decided to take a time off. And of course, especially being in the gender equality discussion, it was hard on it. I think some uh, women were not quite happy that I did so, but it was always my decision. I always take my decision, so I decided I didn't do it for my son, actually. I did it for myself because I, I just wanted to have a, a time off for me um, and I also knew that with Olaf Scholz, the mayor, I had someone who would never let you off, who would always ask you again. And that is actually the point where you have to, in all personal discussion, never uh, let loose. Because even if you take a time off as a man or a woman, you want to come back. And it actually is your boss's job to uh, keep you close to the mm -hmm. company and to offer you the best uh, Mm -hmm. um, possibility to come back and, and that is the problem of course yeah. in our industry where there are no companies and there are no bosses so that is what we as funds public funds have to think of is how can we su have a system that supports and demands the same thing of everyone and I think I mean it's not That's easy it. but it yeah. and as well of course May, uh, because it's a freelance world. Yeah. Because in, you know the movie business is a freelance world, so there's not a regular employer, and so so that's why we need some kind of social measures that will protect, you know, the people that decide to have children, the women that decide to have children, and they're not out of the game, not only for a short time, but in certain cases forever because of that. This is what happens. So that's what we have to work at different levels. I think what's interesting, I mean, um, comparing, let's say, Sweden or learning from Sweden here in Germany, Germany, like because of the federal system and the, the it's, a, it's a very complicated system and it's very difficult to make national, dis something that changes the national grid or change and, and even changing national thinking, obviously, is even harder. Um, what's interesting is that now with you, uh, Nordrhein-Westfalen and Berlin-Brandenburg, you have three women uh, running... Um, funding boards, subsi uh, subsidy boards, which is great. Um, and it just seems... In Bavaria? Oh, really? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> met, uh, I haven't heard the latest gossip. Yeah. Um, but um, uh, so that's things that uh, things are changing. Do you, or do you think that's making an impact? Or do we need a national non-bias seminar? Well, we're which only sounds good. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Well, I think a lot of things have happened, not, not last but not least, that the, the, ver the various surveys that have just been mm -hmm. done, you know, on the status and status of affairs in the industry, and I guess, I guess everybody is made quite sensitive toward the, towards this subject, and especially the biggest gap we had until a couple of years ago in, in, in television, I think we have to differentiate a little bit between TV program and... Um, art house cinema because in tv the quota was actually even a lot worse than it was in in uh, in the free cinema world um, the quota was only 15 percent of television films were directed by women which started a sort of a self-declaration by the, the stations and it's it's been going up or at least i heard from a lot of young directors who told me hey i finally i got a call <laughs> i can direct something for for tv or um which is great because you can have get a little exercise a little practice and that's where the real the real thing is, I think, because it, it's a difference if somebody else wrote a script and you get you it's, it's work for hire and you make a film for television, which I think, come on, women are equally <laughs> able to do mm. to do a thriller for a s Friday evening or for Saturday evening, and, and there's a lot of actually misconceptions going around. We you know what, what what women are able to do in, in terms of work mm. for hire. In, in, in what would we do mainly work, work for cinema, which is a lot of the time based on script written by the directors themselves. There is not so many projects out there, like somebody develops a script and attaches a director. It's a, it's a quite different word from world from television. Mm. I mean, we need to differentiate it. But shocking it was that in TV it was even worse. I don't have any late figures how much it went up, mm. because actually they did try and bring in more women. 
Um, so a lot of has happened on that level. I think that's well, that is kind of the problem yeah. that we are years behind you, no, no. even collecting data. Uh, yeah, yeah. That's not, <laughs> that but is actually uh, a problem. Uh, we included yeah. in our because that's the beginning of the yeah. whole discussion. We yeah. included not only filmmakers but scriptwriters because we think scriptwriters are just as important. Yeah. Who tells the story? Is it a story written from a woman's perspective? That is, you know, fundamental, and. For different reasons, most of our television, at least in French Canada, is written by women. And it explains a lot of the changes in society because television has such an influence on you know, popular television. And most of the scriptwriters are women. And they tell stories about women and from a woman's perspective. And that's how you, society changes and eventually to come to films also, not only very niche films, but also wider audience films. All our institutions in Canada that decide of the money are headed by women. Me, Telefilm Canada, Canadian Media Fund, we're all women, about the same age. So we got there by many ways, and we totally agree on where we have to aim. And we're totally like this which makes a huge difference also, is that we don't fight or bitch each other, we agree. We might have different measures in our own institutions, but we all say the same message. So we're in solidarity, and that is, makes a big, big difference. But I just want to say, uh, I'm so happy for you, but it doesn't come with the sex that you are aware oh, no, that's true. and want to fight for gender equality mm. or even are soli have solidarity. There are some female directors of some big financial institutions in Sweden that are definitely not solidarity with me. And uh, maybe it's because uh, I'm such a horrible person, <laughs> but I actually, I think we need to understand, I'm not saying you don't understand it, but. The unconscious bias is within everyone. Yeah. I'm as, mm. and I've been working with this for 20 years, I am so aware and still I'm unconscious biased, which is uh, needed to understand. That means that we have to have the conversation all the time with everyone and with women because we sort of take them for granted and then we point at the men like they were something else. Yes, some men are very good too. Some men are <laughs> very good and they are... To, um, to the men here, to the gentlemen. And I think the, the, the example which I, I love to say because it's so obvious, the Boston Symphony Orchestra was going to get more musicians to their orchestra and they were only men. So they made it anonymously. So the musicians came in on stage and they had it behind curtains and the jury was sitting in the auditorium. So the musicians came in and they played their little song, men and women, and they went out and the jury picked more men. And there was women and men in the jury. And it was very disappointing and everyone was like, why is this? Is it because of women not being able to practice enough because they take care of the children or they haven't got the gene to get longer fingers? <laughs> or what is, what is the problem here? What is the problem with the women here? And before going into that, they redid the audition with the same men and women in the jury and the same men and women going in doing their audition with the same instruments, this time with a carpet this thick, so you couldn't hear the steps. So you couldn't decide what sex the person had. And suddenly they picked 50-50. Wow. And this is exactly what we see the potential in men. We expect men to be geniuses. We recognize quality when there is a man. But with the women, it's more like, yeah, but I'm not sure. So that is really, and that was men and women sitting there. And I'm sure I would do the same because we're all raised in the structure. And the structure we need to change, I mean, it will take centuries, I'm sure. It's but also for, for women and young women not to back down. And once they get a chance to really take it and, and build, make them ready to take that chance and, and go for it. And yeah. do not question yourself because the, the doubt machine is implanted in little girls. And yeah. 
Yeah. Yes, it starts at six years old. Yeah. Before six, girls think they're just as good as boys. When you do all the surveys, they've done huge surveys in the United States, all the universities together. Before six, they think they're just as good. But when they start school, socializing, you know, outside school, then it lowers. They think the boys are better than they are. And that is and in the reality is the other way. Yeah, and also, together. but it's integrated. You know, there, for example, you have a, mm. a job uh, opening. You have ten criterias. A guy, he gets two, he'll apply. A girl, she doesn't get the ten, she doesn't apply. She thinks she's not good enough. Mm. This is still there. So we are constantly have to be in positive reinforcement all the time, all the time. So we're talking about films now. Now you're, every festival. You go to Cannes, you go to Toronto, there's a panel about this issue everywhere with stars. Okay, we're not stars, we're just, <laughs> well, she's a rock star. About this. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're a rock star. Uh, but you know, you will have these actresses, very well known actresses, and they talk about their pays, and they're less paid, and they're 20 million paid, and the guy is paid 30 million, and it's okay, you know, which is outrageous, by the way, these, <laughs> these, these wages. Um, you know, they're in the system, but they're denouncing that. Um, so it's seize the moment. Because what I would not like to see, okay, it did go along for three or four years, and everybody was talking about it, but then we get, you know, kind of tired about yeah. this issue. And we don't talk about it anymore, and then things go back to normal. So I think we have to be on our toes all the time, all the time. Until it's not achieved, you know, work on it and work on it. And even if you seem to be irritating to a lot of people, who cares, you know? I mean, yes, exactly. have, you, <laughs> have, you, have you any plans yet to, um, in terms of gender equality, in terms of politics? I like here in, in, in Hamburg, being like Hamburg being a city state, the great yeah. thing is you can be quite avant garde, no? Yeah, well, we try it in some parts, but uh, that is also the problem of the federal system that you mm. can do things for Hamburg, but not all legislation that is important for special sector is uh, federal legislation. Um, actually, I'm, I'm, I'm still a learner in this sector. Um, two weeks ago, I had almost the same situation talking to the music industry women. Um, with, I had discussions before, but Actually, whatever cultural sector and media, pro quota media, I know for years already, um, the newspapers are not any better. And even the, the ones you think that are modern, they're sometimes even worse than the conservative ones. Um, so um, actually, I, I'm just trying to combine the different discussions at the moment and trying what I can do for the whole cultural sector. But you were pro quota. Are you still? Yeah. Can you imagine introducing a quota? Well, the quota is not the goal. Mm -hmm. it's, it was actually also are for advisory board. Are you prepared to use it as a threat? <laughs> well, I'm not sure if we could do it <laughs> here, but um, it's a good threat. Um, and actually, th it the works. quota it works. It, it works. Work. That the threat of quotas works. <laughs> no, not always, because the quota for advisory boards, um, we had a, um, um, what do you call it? Um, um, uh, freiwillige Selbstverpflichtung. Uh, uh, <laughs> very hard word. Uh, 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 well, uh, the industry um, tried to uh, avoid the quota for advisory boards for, I think, in Germany, 15 years. We had a 15 year long discussion, even before the discussion was. They had 15 years, or let it be 14, I don't care, but they had 14 years of time. And then, after all that time, the quota came. So um, it took a very long time, and it doesn't always work. Um, at the same time, I said for the boards in Hamburg, I don't take that long time. I do it right now. Um, but um, it was never the goal. But at some time, you have to see the threat doesn't always work. I think we're maybe today we're in a different discussion, and they know that for some parts the quota came. So maybe the cooperation might be easier to threat with a quota mm. if they see that um, if they don't behave, it <laughs> might not be only a threat for decades, but also uh, the be reality. The politician threatened in Sweden 
to have quotas like in Norway. Yeah. They have quotas for 40% women in uh, bigger companies. Mm -hmm. And uh, the rumor is that that really turned out bad. Uh, everyone knows that it's the same 15 women in all the boards and that the, the company's uh, income has gone down. But same every, discussion in all ways. But everything years is actually wrong. It's false. And there are, you know, there's so much research showing it really turned out very good. But that doesn't make its way through media. Mm -hmm. So we were talking about obstacles. I, for me, I find that the biggest uh, obstacle I've met is actually to get the media to want to report that it works. Yeah. Because it's like it's threatening themselves that they have been going on a myth or something. Because they, they really have been accusing me uh, a lot, like big spreads in the morning newspaper. Anna Cerny is using the film culture for political reasons and its uh, political identity. And, and they listen and they pick out the, because they love controversies. And the ones that don't want it, they are loud speakers. So, and you, you just have to live with being considered a bitch. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, it's, it's sometimes, it's really, really tiring. And then it's nice, you know, now we met each other here. <laughs> uh, but Monique and I, we met just like two years ago. Mm -hmm. But you know when you find someone that can give you energy, that's a really, that's an advice for the ones of you out there uh, fighting. Try to get people around you that gives you energy. Not only having like networks where you all whine, wanting something that no one can give, mm. which is a very common thing. <laughs> Everyone wants something that no one can give, then you're just whining. But if you pick people, you can pick people from other industries that can support you, give you energy, so you dare and have the courage actually to always ask, do you count? Because a lot of people say, yeah, we are equal. And then you start scratching, they're not, but they don't count. And the next thing is to dare to ask, do you have a goal? Actually, do you? Are you happy with the situation or do you have a goal? And uh, they usually don't answer, but they get some a reminder and they go home and then you can go with your energy booster friends and you can you know, come back the next day. But it's really important because it can be very uh, tiring to be the one that always telling wh where is the problem and uh, not being able to talk about what we want to talk about, which is film and art and quality. I always get to talk about gender equality. It's like uh, Napoleon said, in an impossible situation, you have to find allies. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and actually yeah. that's why I think networks are so important. It's yeah. with uh, as music industry women, or also as pro quota media and pro quota director. Yeah. Women in music are very inspired now by what's happening in the film business. Mm. Um, which was the first one to come out. Now women in music are trying to organize themselves. Also, uh, some uh, I heard it's in Great Britain, UK, like they're, they're giving an F label to f film festivals that have good programming concerning, you know, women, m films made by women. So it's starting to change. But I want to come back to the media. Mm. The media is also a subculture where yeah. women really have a hard time. Yep. And it's, in many cases, even harder because they're the media. They're supposed to be neutral. And, mm -hmm. But it's mostly male-dominated uh, culture. And it's really a male-dominated culture and the way it works and how they relate to each other. And when we talk to the media and you talk to the to, to people in the media and women journalists, sometimes they're harder on you than the, uh, the men are. Yeah, but on the other side, we hear, since I had a long history with them, um, a very strong network, Pro Quota Media, um, who did really a good job and really powerful job over the last years, who every year give a prize, a good, one good prize, mm. and uh, I think, I don't know, probably 20 bad prizes now, but 
let's say, three or four bad prices, and they measure every year um, the leading positions Good. in all media. And uh, they were always uh, saying, uh, the moment we get 30%, we split up. Mm. Um, after five years now, they uh, realized that some uh, newspapers were going much better. Um, some didn't change at all. So what they did was, okay, now we get serious. Now we take 50%. So they're a really good network, and what I want to say with it is um, try to learn from other networks yeah. because um, there are so many businesses where there are really creative women sitting having so good ideas which you can use for almost every sector. And um, to more um, talk to each other and, and, and uh, cooperate even in some, because you need media, of course, and if you do some cooperation with media women, it's perfect and very um, yeah it's a very powerful mm. network network one one more thing before we open up the um the discussion the room um you know there was the foot wrangler study a study um by german actress um and the university of Ros rostock on um the representation of women in german te television and until the age of 30 it's pretty equal men and women um, and then after the age of 30, women just become invisible. Um, it's sort of a very fast decline in representation. And the question is, um, I mean, okay, maybe a quota isn't necessary for employing people. You can't force them, but uh, wouldn't there be, given that it's public money, most of this, like ARD and, and uh, ZDF, shouldn't there be some kind of quota on content? Um, or even the employ uh, actresses. I mean, why is this so impossible? Why is this like that? Why do women have to become invisible? I mean, when, yeah, okay, um, uh, wh wh I don't know. Is it, why is that so, imp I, I don't really get it. <laughs> well, I guess none of us really get it. But yeah. <laughs> yes, but I <laughs> think, I, like, I mean, <laughs> why, is it, uh, why is it so hard to, uh, to say, okay, guys tell stories um it's public money this is represent your culture this is and uh, you have to go out there not just to um i mean the, it's to entertain it, the 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 remit of the public broadcasters is not just to entertain but, but it's also to enhance society and i don't really get it that um you have public money you have a 50 50 let's say roundabout society, and these, the, these women are not represented on public television. But so if you have yeah. them, that is, all studies that we have been doing is, if you have them behind the camera, Writing. the problem is solved. Writing. It's Story. really, the protagonist suddenly becomes women as well. And you know, the Bechdel-Wallis test, uh, when women do films, they pass the Bechdel-Wallis test every time, 100%. Because we are just, that's about the perspective. We can tell, women can tell stories about men, and men can tell stories about women, but we tend to be more interested in ourselves. That's why we need diversity. We need, if we want to see people on screen that looks like uh, this society, we need to have them behind the, the camera as well. And I, I think that is the, the only answer you need. I don't know. I don't understand why it just has to happen behind the camera. Why? But the other way, you go in and you say, then you really mixture with art. Because then you say to a filmmaker, you can't do your film as you want it. You have to do it with 50-50 on the screen. And then suddenly it's not free art. But if you have it behind the camera, you just say, you do the best film. And then you make sure there is a diversity behind the camera and you have diversity. So then you have free art. I think that's a very important thing because we are always accused of manipulating art, making art mm. political. Yeah, but I mean, every, every, yeah. Art, every, every art form has to deal with the, um, the constraints of the real world. I mean, unless you sit at home and just do it by yourself. I mean, especially the media, like the whole thing about making a movie is that you have to exchange and live in the real world yeah but it's like oh. you writing books and someone telling you you have to have at least five boys no, but in your I mean, book it's like i mean for example let's say i'm a writer yeah. um uh somebody asked me for meeting a commissioner and he says he tells me yeah do you have anything on refugees yeah 
So he wants to like wants the refugee stories because right now it's really hot to do refugees. Um, no, I don't have anything. I'm Why can't he just um, be encouraged to also think about like um, stories with female male characters? You know, encouraging um, is one thing. Yeah. Yeah. Quotas. A quota yeah. is like the yeah. yeah, it's like the the last resort, obviously. But an encouragement, yeah. Well, if I, I if, if let's go to television, okay, yeah. which is a mass uh, audience, and there's no not that much niche television. Television is made for wider audiences. If you look, when they're women scriptwriters, there'll be tons of female roles of all ages. It's the one that writes the story that makes the difference. So if you have more women scriptwriters or screenwriters, you'll get more role for women of all ages. Mm. And this is measured. Mm. So that's where you have to start. So you have to go and say to the public televisions, you have to hire more stories or you know, series written by women. And whoever directs them, mm. you know, we'll see. Mm -hmm. But it has to start with the story, the script. You know, you can never make a good film with a bad script. You can, you can make a bad film sometimes with a good script. <laughs> but, you know, it starts with a script. Yeah, yeah. Should we, let's open up the room. Any questions? Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. oh, is that a study you just um, cited, the last one? Because you said it was measured. That um, if you put yes, yeah, you uh, uh, um, what's their name? Um, it's an institute. Yeah. What's your name? The uh, Talma and Louise. Is, is that Gina yeah. Davis? Yeah, it's okay. all measured. All it's right. all measured. Okay, that's yeah. just what you I can to find know. it on the internet. And can I just say that you are all amazing energy boosters up there? <laughs> <laughs> I, I just love that idea of the energy booster friend, um, <laughs> and it's all working in women's organisations. It's just a very nice idea, and I think the energy you're just giving right now is very touching. Thank you very much for that. Yes, thank you. <laughs> <coughs> Thanks. I was wondering if it's possible, as and this is probably a question for Anasana, to uh, demand of the projects that you give support that they earmark some of the money for caretaking, so that every film project has an amount of money that the production team can use for ch ch child care, so that that should not be an obstacle for either men or women who has a, a baby. And the other question is, can you give us one of your one-liners that you mentioned <laughs> in the beginning? <laughs> oh, I'm dying to hear what you're saying. <laughs> okay. uh, in regards of the first question, uh, I think, and I'm, I mean, of course there is, there is this problem in Sweden, but we have one of the world's best baby care system where you, you put your child in from they are 18 months and then they are there the whole days. So uh, I would say it's not as a big problem in Sweden as in most other countries. Uh, and in regards of, uh, but of course we could look into that if that would be, I never heard that from anyone except from Hillian. Okay, she's the producer from Sweden, and she's another energy booster. <laughs> but uh, obviously, when we do fund, you can have a part of your funding going to childcare. We accept that as. We have to negotiate with you, but I think we will say yes. I, I, I think we, I'm sure we will say yes. <laughs> and uh, one of my one liners would be, uh, which is, uh, <laughs> it's a Swedish expression, but it's the one that pops up. It's when they say, you know, and where did all the good women go from film school? Which is a long explanation and you have to go into structures. Then you can just say, yeah, in Sweden we say uh, suck on that one, which means <laughs> that, yeah, yeah, I don't know how you think about that one. About that one. Yeah. And then they're just very confused and they realize <laughs> I know something they don't know and it's end of discussion. Because sometimes you just can't win the discussion. Yeah. 
That's a good one. For me to know, for you to find out. Yeah. <laughs> Hi. Um, since uh, one of the studies we did at um, the University of Rostock uh, was already mentioned, I work there. Um, I just wanted to come back to that discussion behind and in front of the camera, because you already mentioned the Furtwängler study that we did, but also before we did a few studies about behind the camera. And that you can definitely look at the correlation between that, just like uh, Anna and uh, Monique already said, that if you have, for instance, um, female producers, they usually draw uh, or work more with um, female script writers and also directors. And then at the same time, there is a correlation that you have um, more diverse characters, both in men and women, if you have more women behind the camera. So, so there is, the statistics are there also for German film. So it's not like, you know, we, we wouldn't know that. Um, so out of that, two questions. Um, one would be, why are the Germans or the Hamburg people so afraid of the quota? Well, and I'm also, not. do you monitor numbers now in, in Hamburg? Like, do oh, you, do you gave, count? I just gave the figures. I mean, I can repeat them if you want me to. And no, no, I, that's not what I mean. I mean, do you actually monitor numbers on a regular basis? Yes, Okay. We've been doing that since uh, 2005, as far as I remember. Um, as I can remember from the statistics, and from now on, we would do that regularly, yes. And I hope I made it sure that, that I'm not afraid of quota, <laughs> not at all, but um, I think it's not the beginning of the discussion, it's the threat or the end. Yeah. The, the last resort. Yeah. The last resort that has to be dangling up there. Yeah. But um, it works, I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. I saw it already. <laughs> I mean, it's hard for us to require a quota when there's 35% applications of women, you know, what can we do? Which I think I try to make it clear that we try to encourage women to apply and also in the decision process to give a very decent look at these projects, which have been given out, statistically spoken, more money than the projects by men, I think. It would be nice if we could avoid a quota with a co process which has started and which, which I think is going in the right direction. Hello, it's always talked about uh, directors and um, mm -hmm. I'm a DOP, I work as a cinematographer and there it's only 2% I think of women working in the TV or in cinema that are really on projects. And um, yeah, I feel it really how hard it is in this thing and what you said, Anna, I have heard so often in the last time, really very often and so I wish to myself that it's not only always spoken about uh, directors and all this, also the other women in film, mm. of course, also yeah, DOPs, componists and uh, producers, all this. And I, I wish that something will change. And um, mm -hmm. I could imagine also to go to, to Sweden later or to Norway. That sounds yeah. so yeah. nice. Yeah, yeah. really. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, really. it really shows, and I, I'm sorry, I should have said that we, we do monitor directors, script writers and producers. But now since we reached the end of our action plan, the next action plan is to as well count DOP and editors as that's part of our database. So because what we see is that as we have given money to female directors, the female DOPs have increased so much that in the last award we have, our Oscar award, uh, the, the three nominees were uh, two women, no man, because one of the DOPs got two nominations. So for the first time, she actually won. And that uh, it makes such a role modeling thing because it shows that, and then suddenly it says, yeah, that's because you have as well another perspective of how you shoot. Yeah. And that is obvious when you see it, but you don't know it before. But when you see a film uh, shot by a, a female DOP, it, it looks different. Like any other perspective makes a difference. So. Uh, I really understand that you you want us to talk about more about you because you are very important in the process. And it's it, us, I've, I've noticed a significant amount of DOPs, women DOPs, in Canada, very significant. 
because there is no physical obstacle anymore. You know, the weight and the strength, which was used for so many years, doesn't exist anymore. And wonderful DOPs. And as Anna said, the same thing, they're the best. But also what I want, I think what's, I think what needs to be made clear here, what came out so far is, it's really important who you team up with. Like surround yourself, and I think what's become clear is, let's say, a sm relatively small place like Hamburg that's pro-women and is trying to encourage women and trying to be as pro-women as possible without introducing the last resort of quotas is very important. And I mean, what I found in my work is also don't bother with the people where you know you're just going to have problems all the time and you're just going to, you know, uh, fight against windmills. Um, team up with the people you enjoy working with and you know who are like get you and what you want to do and don't um, uh, see you as a problem because you're a woman. If that's the case, then lost cause. I mean, um, and and I think it's it's yeah to look out and look for allies who are on your side. And I think Hamburg seems to be one of those places if you're a woman. Yeah. Well, I can only say, low, it's mm. a courage, everybody, team up with your female teams, you know, and I think it's a good time. I mean, just the development of the last couple of years shows there's a lot of creativity, a lot of great films coming by women, and it seems it's going in a very, very good direction. That's my opinion. There are many, uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we've talked, as uh, you've been talking a lot about funding, I just want to, to mention or to ask, you know, that's, you, you want to give more funds to women or to women in the industry, but I think it's maybe the question sometimes should be the other way around. What kind of fundings do women need? Because I think sometimes it's that women do need other kinds of fundings because I think it's like with the microcredits, like I think some people or some women in the industry would rather get some microcredits, some microfundings as well than rather big budgets for the films they are going to shoot, or the films they are going to make, or to produce, or to write the stories. And I think this is, there should be surveys about that as well. You know, ask women what they, what do they want, what kind of fundings would they like to get? You mean in terms of the different statuses of production or script writing or? Well, of course, we're open to hearing more ideas. We've tried to open up the whole system as much as mm -hmm. possible and introducing a new tool, which is a treatment funding, so to enable everybody to step in or uh, to come to us as soon as possible so we can provide funding. But if there is more in ideas, let us know. I, I just want to reflect on your question because I, I'm the president of WIFT Sweden and, and actually we asked one of our very talented uh, directors, uh, Gabriela Pislu had a film a couple of years ago, Eat, Sleep, Die, and we made a panel with her once and we asked her, what do you think about the funding system? And she said, oh, it should be so nice if someone, if they sometimes in were interested about my needs and I was the one who defined the needs. And I think that's also something that's very often in between men and women, that th people think that they know more about your needs than yourself. And it's it, two ways to, to find a solution is that we are better to really uh, communicate our needs. And of course, that the systems are sensitive to ask for your needs. So, so I, I'm, I'm, I like that you asked the question. Thank you. But that is interesting. Uh, I would love to hear more about that as well, because of course, we always want to get input on how to improve. But we have been, we are redoing our whole support si system right now. And we've been meeting with so many representatives of all kinds of skills, like scriptwriters, directors, DOPs, everything. And no one actually ever said that. So I think maybe the, you need to, uh, maybe WIFT could do something about that to kind of encourage a new way of thinking because we get all stereotyped in how we think. So I think that's a very good idea to uh, kind of try to lift that lid a little bit because maybe there is something there that we, but we've been asking very much. 
I, I have to break off now. Oh. The um, broadcast is going to end. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, so no, unless wanna, we want to just fade to black. To um, just say something on what you said. When you look at budgets, uh, the higher the budget, oh. the less women. Can I just say goodbye and then Bye. we'll just oh. come and <laughs> goodbye and we'll just keep on talking. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Did you say goodbye? Yeah. <laughs> 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 so, <laughs> the higher the budget, the less percent of women, and you go down. So, fi feature fiction. Then, feature fiction, you have big budgets, medium budgets, low budgets. Then, of course, proportion of women is.